If we want to access the internet from the boat, we have two options while we're in a marina. The first is a SIM card, obviously. We've got a little internet box which acts as a Wi-Fi hotspot. You plumb a SIM card into it and you get internet on the boat. Um, the only downside of that is that it can get quite expensive. When we were in Portugal, it was only a euro a day for unlimited internet, so we could watch Netflix, Spotify, no problems at all. But here in Spain, there's no concept of unlimited, so you absolutely pay through the nose for your internet. The second option is to find a Wi-Fi hotspot. If you're lucky, and you rarely are, then there's Wi-Fi in the marina. The alternative to that is to find a cafe somewhere, sit and drink a beer while you download or upload whatever it is that you want to get or receive from the internet. Some people have Wi-Fi boosting antennas but these can be quite expensive such as the bullet uh, and they're not trivial to configure. Now these methods as I said they only work in the marina or if you're close enough to shore to get a mobile signal but if you're on passage say in the middle of the Atlantic what options do you have? Now this week we've pushed out all the boats and we've got an expert in who is not only handsome, but rather rugged and dashing as well. Thanks, Martin. Very nice of you to say so. So Martin, tell us. Why do you need internet on passage? The reason we need internet on passage is mostly to download weather data. These come in small compressed files called grib files and then you load them into your chart plotter and it overlays uh, weather predictions, rain, swell, wind, uh, on your current position. Send and receive short emails so that's mostly what you would use it for. You don't need it for Netflix or Spotify because you download, you download all that uh, while you've got a good Wi-Fi connection on land. And what are the current options available for receiving internet while on passage? Okay, so you've got two main offerings. Uh, the first is something called a geostationary satellite. And now these are the things that you're probably going to be receiving your um, digital TV signals from. You know, you have a dish, you point it at a fixed point in the sky and you start receiving a whole bunch of data. Um, the same thing can be done for internet. The problem is that these geostationary satellites are at about 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth. Um, they're that far away because that is the, the distance at which point, if the satellite is traveling at just the right speed, it falls towards the Earth at the same rate that the Earth falls away from the satellite. So it appears that while the Earth is turning, the satellite is dropping around. So relative to a position on the Earth, it stays in the same place in the sky. So that's yeah. particularly useful for things like satellite TV, um, but it can also be used for um, transferring data and connecting to the internet. The problem is that it's because it's so far away from the Earth, a round trip for the data to get there and back takes anywhere between 800 milliseconds and a whole second. So it's not great for real-time communications. The clever bloke who came up with the idea was um, Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke back in 1945. Uh, the problem with these geostationary satellites is that they have about 260 gigabytes total throughput capacity, which means that's the amount of data that they can send back down to Earth at any one particular time, which, given that there's only one of these satellites in the sky visible at any one time, you've got to share that bandwidth with every single user of that satellite, so you get pretty poor uh, you can get pretty poor performance when it comes to downloading bandwidth. If you're just having a dish on the side of the house, you just point the dish at the satellite, job done. If you're on a boat, it's a little more tricky because the boat is moving around constantly. So they have what's called stabilised antennas and it's basically a gimbal with the dish sat on top and then they put a special dome over the top so that it doesn't get blown around by the wind and things like that. Uh, the second option is something called Iridium Next, and that is a constellation of 66 
low Earth orbit satellites. Um, these are arranged in polar orbital planes. I think there's something like six satellites in each plane, and then the planes are staggered around the Earth. And this is a tr this gives truly global coverage um, for internet and voice calling and stuff like that. Uh, the satellites operate at about 750 kilometers, so while they're much better than geostationary satellites, there is still quite a bit of latency on the data. Again, the bandwidth is between about 64 kilobytes to 140 kilobytes, uh, but there are plans to upgrade that to about 1.4 megabytes, which is which is quite good. So you you know that's you could browse the web with that. And is it simple to set up? These use uh, an omnidirectional antenna, which is really just a box that sits up on the roof of the boat and it just broadcasts in all directions, so it doesn't need to be stabilised. Uh, and this is one of the great advantages to uh, Iridium Go, which is the whole package that you buy. Um, you put an antenna box on the outside of the boat and then you have like a Wi-Fi hotspot inside the boat that connects to the antenna and then you've got basically Wi-Fi connected to the internet so you can send emails from your, your your laptop or you know your mobile phone if you wanted to all that good stuff and again download your grib files and analyze incoming weather data so while these two satellite options are okay for small downloads like grib files or small emails and whatnot uh, there are considerable limitations on there yes which is why there is considerable excitement about what's coming next to the market Yes indeed, ladies and gentlemen, and this would be Starlink. <laughs> Come on then, Martin. Tell us all about Starlink and why it's different from, say, Iridium or Viasat. It's very exciting because it's going to effectively be just as good as land-based broadband, um, only it's going to be coming from space, so it will be available anywhere on the planet. Well, not anywhere on the planet. There's a bald spot at the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, but apart from that, it's truly, it will be truly global, um, which is why it's so exciting. Um, it's made by a company called SpaceX. Uh, they're pretty famous for launching and landing orbital rockets. Very exciting stuff. Uh, and it consists of a constellation of quite possibly up to 30,000 satellites. Now that's insane when you think about it, that up to date we've only ever launched, as a human race, 9,000 rockets into space. So over the next year there's going to be an additional possibly 30,000 satellites in space. That's absolutely bonkers. It's coming in phases, so phase one will be a constellation of 4,400 satellites and they'll be in different shells so it won't completely clog up the sky. Um, that will be phase one and then phase two will have about seven and a half thousand satellites in it. Uh, these will be flying at about 550 kilometers. That's obviously subject subject to change, and it depends which shell the satellites are in. But it's roughly about 550 kilometers. Um, initial tests have shown that the latency is about 20 milliseconds, which is just as good as land-based broadband, uh, if not a little bit better actually, because eventually uh, the satellites will communicate between each other in space using lasers. So if you had an internet packet going from, say, London to New York, it's going to be about 40% faster going through the Starlink network because lasers through the vacuum of space are about 40% faster than light going through a fiber optic cable, for instance. The throughput per satellite is about one terabyte. So that's a lot of a lot of bandwidth for the users on the ground. They could that's about forty thousand people all streaming a different four K movie at the same time. And will it work out at sea on a boat? You know, with all the rocking and the movement of the boat. Yeah, it will work on a boat, um, even with the movement. Uh, just like with, well, it's slightly different to the Iridium antenna because the Iridium antenna is omnidirectional, so it just broadcasts in every direction. The Starlink antennas will be using something called a phased array, which means that it's got lots of little antennas inside it, and it uses a science called beam forming, which means that it can, through software and electronics, point the beam and track the beam 
to exactly where the satellite is in the sky. So it's pretty clever stuff. So yeah, on the boat, basically the electronics and the software will do will handle the motion of the boat to make sure that the beam is always pointed at the satellite. Now being on a boat out at sea at night with no clouds, it's undoubtedly the best place to go stargazing uh, and watching the night sky. And there's quite a bit of concern, isn't there, about whether or not all these satellites will clog up the night sky and absolutely destroy astronomy for everybody. Yeah. Uh, is that true? Uh, the astronomical uh, society is pretty much up in arms about all these um, massive constellations of satellites and they're claiming that it's going to ruin astronomy forever. Um, initially, when they first started launching satellites uh, for Starlink, it was a pretty spectacular sight. You could see the train of 60 satellites dashing across the sky and there's even a website you can go to where you can put in your, pos your current position and it will tell you which direction to look, which part of the sky and what time to look to see the satellites coming over. Um, that's pretty exciting but yeah it's not great for astronomy so there's a number of things they've done is uh, geniusly they've started to paint them black <laughs> um, but one of the big problems is the reflection off the solar panels which are pretty big so they've got something called star shades which will fold out when the um, when the satellites are raising their orbit so that it doesn't interfere with uh, with astronomy and also they will um, tilt the um, solar panels so that there's not as much reflection from the sun onto the earth. Uh, the other problem with the satellites is like what do we do with all that junk up there? What happens when the satellites start to break? You know 30,000 bits of junk is going to cause a significant problem in the future if you don't do something about it. So the current version of the satellites um, NASA has given St uh, SpaceX a minimum standard by which the satellites have to deorbit or have the capability to deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, and SpaceX has exceeded that considerably. With the version 1 satellites, 95% of the satellite will burn up on re-entry. But with the version 2 satellites, 100% of the satellite will burn up on re-entry. So you don't have to worry about space debris, which is great. Well, that's all really exciting, but when can we have it? How much is it going to cost? Right, well, actually, Starlink is currently in operation in certain parts of the world. There are 720 satellites currently in orbit. Um, and the, the way that they are oriented at the moment, it gives two bands of coverage around the Earth um, sort of Canada and Northern America sat, um, position and at the lower part of the earth sort of Australia and the South Pacific there's not much down there but uh, that's just the way the orbits are at the moment they need about 800 satellites in orbit to cover the whole planet uh, which is not far off they're about to launch another 60 satellites today they're manufacturing about 120 satellites per month. Um, so they're really gung-ho with this. They're not hanging about. They've already got user terminals which work. Uh, that's the little dish which, you know, you plug it into your laptop. And it's literally, Elon Musk has said, you literally take it out of the box, plug it in and point it at the sky. And that's all you need to do. Um, so really easy and straightforward. The downside at the moment is that with these version 1 satellites they are unable to communicate with each other once they're in space. The way the data gets back to Earth and routed into the internet is that the satellite needs to be flying over a ground station. Okay, Now that's obviously going to be a problem in the middle of, of the Atlantic. There are no ground stations in the middle of the Atlantic so coverage will not be available in the Atlantic or the Pacific at the moment but with the version 2 satellites that come in phase 2 they will be capable of communicating with each other using lasers so what that enables is that if you have a user terminal on a boat which is in the middle of the Atlantic it can send data up to a satellite that satellite does not need to be within range of a ground station but it just goes well hang on that satellite over there is closer to a ground station than I am so it beams the data using a laser across to the other satellites absolute bloody genius uh, and eventually satellite to satellite to satellite 
you know, however many hops it takes to get to a satellite which is over a ground station, that satellite then beams the data down to the internet. And you might think, oh, that's going to take a really long time, but actually it's faster than routing it through fiber optic cables on the ground. Um, when is it going to be available? Well, like I say, there's 720 up there at the moment. They're throwing them up m month on month. Uh, so throughout 2021, it will be available globally, I imagine. It's going to cost about between $100 and $200 for the, for the, for the antenna and $80 a month. $80 a month for internet satellite. $80, wow, <laughs> that's cheap. That's crazy. $80 a month. I can't wait. Brilliant. I, for one, can't wait to get this on board Ollie. We've spent an absolute fortune on SIM cards and sitting in cafes, drinking beer, downloading over dodgy Wi-Fi. So we're absolutely chomping at the bit. Yeah, I can't wait. Thanks, Martin. You're welcome, Martin. We'll see, see you on next, next episode. exciting episode. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like and subscribe. Help us make more videos like this by joining our Patreon family.